Regular human beings sometimes wonder what it is that mathematicians do. Truth be told, sometimes they don't even ask because they have been trained to expect an answer that they wouldn't understand, so why even bother? Their guess, however, is that mathematicians spend their hours writing and pondering upon long complex formulas or doing rocket calculations. And while well, that sure happens, that is just the technical side of math, in the same way as it is for a baker to care for their yeast. We often think that math people give evasive or vague answers over their daily lives, but they are not necessarily vaguer than what a baker would say. I mean, saying that you bake bread is for sure understandable by a broad audience, we all know what bread is, but what is it that they actually do for hours every day? You can get a less evasive answer such as, I keep my yeast healthy, but there is still a lot of detail missing there as well. The only difference with math, though, is that when asked what they do, people can't say, we do math, because it doesn't mean anything more. So I want to make an attempt of explaining what it means to do math by showing it in action with a beautiful and hopefully understandable example. If you have been around in this three-dimensional world for a while, you will have certainly noticed that there are a gazillion objects around us. There's pencils, laptops, books, bowls, pots, and many more. In fact, there is just too many, and they're all different from each other. Messy minds are often overly tidy minds in the sense that they need a tidy world. If the world is messy, they need to tidy it up or they would get lost. So given this huge variety of entities that surrounds us, our picture of the world would be so much simpler and tidier if we could group some together. One could say that pencils and pens both belong to the stationary category, for example, but we're looking for something more fundamental here, something that just looks at the objects regardless of the human goal they were devised for. So in the end, the fundamental question we are asking is, what objects can be called equal? As other question as it might seem, you have for sure unconsciously already provided some answer to this question at some point in life. For example, by saying that balls of different colors are still balls, and balls of different sizes are also still balls. Funny enough though, it doesn't take long for the problem to become more subtle. For example, how about a deformed ball? After all, nobody would think of stating that a slightly deformed ball is not a ball anymore, or that a bumpy mistake in the drawing produces a wholly different shape. But how much can we deform it so that we'd still classify it as a ball? How much bumpy can it get? Are these still balls? And if not, what amount of imperfection will make them stop being balls? This is a genuine problem that arises in many situations and deserves more thought than we usually grant it. In other words, how do we set a threshold when it is completely arbitrary? Since it is impossible to set a threshold over what is a ball and what is a too much bumpy ball, and as much uncomfortable as it could feel, the wisest approach might be to just accept that these all classify as balls. And notice, this is not much different from saying that a red and a green ball are still balls. In the end, we are saying that the color doesn't matter when trying to capture the essence of the object. Here, we are really doing the same, but with a shape instead. However, we sure don't want to end up tricking ourselves into false conclusions here and start saying that everything is a ball. For example, if we take a ball and cut it in half, can we still say we have a ball? One might want to argue that each of the two parts has some resemblance to a ball, but taken together and apart as they are, they can't really be equal to a single ball. Can we say a donut equal to a ball? That would be another hard point to make. At this point, we start realizing that the initial question, what objects can be called equal, is too vague, and that to address it, we need to dive in and shave off some layers of vagueness. That question has allowed us to start and got us to the point where we have a couple examples of objects that we think should be considered equal, 
like a ball and an imperfect ball, or not equal, like a ball and a donut, but now we need to go further. Now that we have spent some time pondering about equality in objects, the question we had lingering in our minds has probably taken a slightly different shape. All this playing with balls, in fact, got our consciousness somewhat heightened. The most important effort now is to pinpoint how the question has evolved. And really, do it for yourself. Dive into your thoughts and try to understand how your understanding of the problem has evolved and what question now will push it even further. One question one could ask now is, what does it mean for two objects to be equal? Or rather, since we have invented the rules ourselves, what should it mean for two objects to be equal? But let us go back to our initial intuitive notion of equality among balls. Maybe trying to start by immediately defining what equal should mean for shapes in general was a bit optimistic. However, what if we started from one object and asked, what actions can we perform on this object so that we would still consider the result to be of the same kind? This question is still somewhat hovering around equality, but we have taken a step away already. In our effort to pinpoint what it is that we're trying to capture, we have polished our initial question and landed onto something different from the beginning. This is really something. So, what actions should we allow? Well, translation is fine, because where an object is located doesn't for sure change its essence. No matter where they are, these are all balls. Shrinking and enlarging are also fine, because we have decided that the size of the object doesn't matter for its classification. A big ball and a small ball are still balls. Rotating should also be fine, because this is a triangle, and this is also a triangle, and this is also a triangle. In other words, the viewpoint shouldn't change the object. Stretching and growing limbs, in some sense, are also fine, as we discovered with the bumps on the balls before. On the other hand, we discover that cutting is really not fine, otherwise we would end up saying that two separate objects are like a ball. Similarly, by cutting a hole in the center, we would end up saying that a donut is like a ball. So cutting is a no-no. Twisting should also be approached with care, otherwise we could obtain a helix from a rectangular shape and this seems a bit overreaching. Fair enough, so translating, stretching, resizing, rotating, those will all leave the essence of the object, whatever it means, still intact. We will now just glide over, but here it would be a very good idea to stop and experiment a bit to make sure that nothing unexpected can happen with those actions so that we know that we are allowing something that isn't flawed. While we have for sure taken a step forward, it is still not quite enough. In fact, it is still vague in the sense that I can give you a shape and ask, can you trace it back to a ball using the allowed actions? If you can, then great, it is for sure equal to a ball. But if you can't, how do you know nobody can? Could it be that you can't see a sequence of actions that actually exists and that would transform that shape back to a ball? So it looks like we still need to dive in more, to refine the question even further and make it more precise. But here already, let's stop to appreciate how much of a different problem we are now tackling. Or so it looks at least. We started from the wish of grouping objects together, and now we are reasoning about actions we can perform on a ball. Can you see how we went from a vague grand question to a seemingly irrelevant detail? Fair enough. So we've got to the point where we have decided that a big bumpy Frankenstein is equivalent to a ball at least according to our newborn theory, where stretching, resizing and rotating are all allowed. How do we continue from here? The question we asked before has made its time now and needs to change. Stemming from our latest progress, we could now ponder about what a Frankenstein born of a ball has in common with the ball. And there are many ways in which this question could be rephrased, for example its opposite 
how does a donut differ from a ball? But there is one way which can prove more enlightening than others, and that is, is there something we can do on the Frankenstein that we cannot on the ball? And again, let's stop for a second to appreciate the distance we've so far gone in changing question. One might wonder, how do you know which question is best? And the answer is that you just don't know, and you often just guess and see where it leads. At this point, you might probably start just doodling and drawing looks on the ball out of frustration, thinking that all your efforts in tidying up the world have resulted in this slightly arguable conclusion that a Frankenstein shape is akin to a ball and nothing else of value. And drawing loops seems really the only constellation to a dull, chaotic existence where not even objects can be grouped together. Except, except that at some point you are struck by the fact that you now have another problem of the same sort. It's just on a different scale. When are two loops equal? And you might indulge yourself into this problem, either because you believe it will be helpful for the original problem, or really just to get a diversion from the daunting task you had set yourself at the beginning. Whichever way, the path turns out to be quite similar to what we had already explored, and as we quickly end up wondering, is a slightly smaller loop different from a slightly larger one? Sure, they're not exactly the same, in the same way as two slightly different balls are not exactly the same, but would you say they belong to a whole different category? And playing with this idea, the problem of setting a threshold comes back again. As we did before, you go all in and say that when there's no logical threshold, then there is really no meaningful way to set one, and it's best to not set one. You think again about the allowed actions and shapes, and in the end, you realize that with them, on a ball, all loops are equivalent, because they cannot be shrunk to a point. You just need to make it smaller and smaller, as if pulling a rope laying on a field. You start from any large tour, and you make it a tad smaller, and another tad smaller, and another tad smaller, until it becomes just a dot. Hmm. Then you test this on the Frankenstein as well. And it turns out that the same thing happens there as well. All loops can be retracted to their starting or ending point. Looking at loops then, a ball and its Frankenstein look equal. For both, any loop can be collapsed to a point. So there, we unexpectedly got some answer to our question, what does a Frankenstein born of a ball have in common with the ball? And we got to this conclusion not by thinking about the problem itself, but thinking about something that looked completely unrelated. Fueled by new enthusiasm then, it feels natural to take a donut and this time ask, is there anything that we can do on a ball that we cannot on a donut? It is obviously very tempting to try the whole loops thing again, because, I mean, it got us places once, so why not? So you start drawing loops in the donut, and you notice that those also can be retracted to a point. So it feels quite a dead end again, and this whole loose thing feels even a bigger frustration because it felt so promising. You're frankly ready to give up and start a long-awaited career as a baker with a boring but stable yeast routine until you think about another way of taking a loop by actually going around the hole. And that loop? That one that cannot become a single point, at least if we enforce the rule that the loop must always live entirely on the surface of the object, which does make sense, otherwise any loop could be transformed into a point. But with that rule, it will be impossible to retract a loop that encompasses the donut into a point. We might shrink it a bit, but as soon as we reach the borders of the hole, we can't go further. In fact, either way we choose to go around the donut hole, either the short or the long route, we cannot shrink the loop and remain on the surface. So it looks like on the donut, not all loops are equal. Some cannot be contracted to a point. And what's more, on the donut there are two different unique ways of making loops, because without breaking them we cannot transform one in the other. So there, this is indeed something that tells apart bowls and donuts. 
Here a new rush of enthusiasm kicks in, except that this time you have become a bit more cautious because you know it can be crushed in a second. But nevertheless, you take some more shapes and think about what this theory would do with them. For example, a circle, so one without any interior, with a huge hole in the center. There is one clear way of making a loop along the circle's perimeter, and there doesn't seem to be any more. It is also impossible to transform this loop so that it would become a point, because it is really just a rope around the hole. So the circle is indeed different from the ball, where all loops can become points, and also different from the donut, where there are two distinct ways of making loops around its hole. And what's more, all similar shapes will exhibit the same behavior. So all in all, this theory seems to be doing something in accordance to our initial goal. There are still a million questions to be asked and a million details to care for, but it's a good start at least. Stepping back, looking at the ball and the donut and how the whole loops idea works, we might realize that the way this theory tells apart balls from donuts is by the hole in the donut. In hindsight, we might be tempted to say, well, of course a ball and a donut are different, one has a hole and one doesn't. But it wasn't so obvious at the beginning. It wasn't so clear what the feature was that told them apart. We had to take baby steps and change the question many times before it took a shape that eventually led us to a meaningful conclusion. In the end, we ended up building a rough theory that basically counts holes in a shape, but it has taken us an astounding number of tweaks to the original question for us to land here, and we have ventured to think about matters, the loop thing for example, that at first sight seems so far away from the problem at hand. According to this newborn theory then, what objects are equal? Well, roughly two objects are equal if they have the same number of holes. And even though I might have made it look all neat and tidy, still weird and unintuitive things can happen with this theory. For example, the shape of an 8, which has two holes and is two-dimensional, looks equivalent to a donut, which has one hole and is three-dimensional. But this is the price to pay for a tidy world, although we could for sure tidy up some more. Now, if you ask a mathematician that works in this field what it is that they do, they will tell you crazy things about loops and other fancy constructions, not much differently from the baker who might tell you about the routine of keeping his yeast healthy. The only difference, the reason why everybody appreciates the work of the baker, is that everybody knows that yeast makes bread rise. They don't know how it happens, but they know what it does. Whereas with math, if you just talk about loops or some other detail of the everyday routine, most people simply lack the familiarity with it. And that's it, nothing more. It's not that they're dumb, it's just that they don't know about it. So to wrap up, what is it the mathematicians do? Well, the truth is, most of the time of professional mathematicians goes into understanding what it is that they're trying to do, into pinpointing their question and into understanding what it is that they're looking for. We did not start from a question and directly derived an answer. Rather, we started from a big real-world wish of classifying objects, which slowly evolved into comparing only two similar objects, which eventually led us to ponder about loops and surfaces. And this is what a good deal of mathematics is about, pinpointing what it is that we are trying to do. Sure, we want to be able to say what objects are equal, but what does it actually mean? How do we carry it out? We could never forget the initial problem, but we had to be willing to take detours. And as a final remark, as much abstract as this attitude can seem, it is a terrific ability in life, which everybody is provided with, at least to some extent. For example, say you want to explore Africa. It's a great goal, but it's also grand and vague. How do you even get started? Well, there's many preparatory steps you need to take, for sure, like booking flights. 
But you also need to think about proper vaccination and health insurance. And then you need to plan what to see and do. You will have to make choices as you clearly can't visit every single place. And it quickly becomes clear that to make that grand goal happen, there is a million small tasks that need to be cleared and some are not even so much clearly connected with the big goal. And by the time you find yourself comparing health insurances, the thought of exploring Africa is really at the back of your mind. So yeah, mathematicians do complex calculations and they do ponder over long equations, but mostly they're trying to figure out what it is that they're trying to do. And that is hardly a straight path.